this morning. And as we get rolling, you will notice that Ronnie is not down here, and neither is Danny. Y'all pray for Danny. Danny was supposed to bring the word this morning, and yesterday he called and said, Hey, I'm just a little under the weather, and I want to be careful. And so y'all pray for Danny. And then also, we're very thankful for Cliff and our worship band as they're picking up uh, where Casey has left off, as Casey is also uh, recovering. And so y'all remember Casey as he's getting stronger every day, but we're thankful uh, for our uh, for our worship team and what they are doing for us just uh, before we get into service a couple of things first tonight at 5 30 we have our vote for our uh, interim children's ministry team that will be at 5 30 if you're a covenant member and you're 16 years old or older please be there at that meeting it's very important and uh, we'll be voting on our children's ministry interims okay so that's at 5 30 and we're going to meet in here for that vote we didn't want to go somewhere and then outgrow the room so we'll be right here in this room voting on that this evening and so that will take place 5 30 here uh, also uh, this week there's a children's event on thursday it's uh, lunch and a movie please be patient with us the movie we we're going to see was at our theater and they removed it from our theater uh, and so now we're trying to make sure we know where we can go and uh, and so that will be announced tomorrow we're trying to make sure uh, that we have everything lined out for that but so uh, that was something unplanned so if you're planning on going to lunch and movie the way that works is we'll put out where we're going to eat and what time and then we can uh, the movie will tell you what time and what location and if you want to join us, we'll just be there for a time of fellowship and fun with kiddos and parents. And uh, so make plans for that if you can. And so tonight, 530, is our uh, special called business meeting to vote on children's coordinator, uh, children's uh, interim uh, ministry team, and then the children's event on Thursday. But with that, let me pray. And then we do have a baptism after our first song, so we're very thankful for that, I believe. I think they're up there. And so we're excited about that. But let me pray for us as we begin worship this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be in your house. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us and what you do when we don't know what you're doing. But even without any of the things that you're doing currently right now, you sent Jesus while we were yet sinners to die for us, making a way for us to worship you, making a way for us to have relationship with you, and that even when Christ ascended, he said, I will not leave you alone. And he sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we thank you for the example you set. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. And you are our Lord and King of kings. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move now in this place. That you would move in our hearts as we worship. And Holy Spirit, that you would bring us closer to the Father through your word and through the worship of God. We thank you again for our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. I know Danny's not here to tell you that the weather is great, but the weather is great outside. If you could stand with us as we sing. I was buried could carry that kind of weight it was my too till I met you and I was breathing but not alive and all my failures I tried to hide it was my turn till I met you. You called my name.
sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I need shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you are my You can be seated, you can be seated, and if you will direct your attention to the baptistry. This is Connor Barr, and I'm going to ask if family members would stand at this time. If you were a Sunday school teacher in the children's area or a vacation Bible school leader, if you'd stand also at this time in honor of Connor's baptism. Connor will be going into the first grade this year. Connor, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Okay, and you want to follow him in baptism. Connor, it's my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ. Raise the wall. Let me pray. Grace, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this young man who's made this decision in front of all these people. Father, I pray that through this you'll touch hearts. Father, that others would become obedient just as he has been. Father, may he set the pace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Stand with us again as we sing.
Heavenly Father, pray with me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for bringing us here today to be led to, to sing your praises, Lord, and to, to bless your holy name, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will be with us as we continue to sing. Oh, praise the name. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh pray
Just uh, thank you for that opportunity that we have. We ask that you would just be with uh, Pastor West right now as he brings the message to us this morning. Lord, help us to have the open ears that we need to receive the message that you have brought forth today. In Jesus' name, amen.
know what to do whisper his name you're standing on the edge of your broken dreams better days seem so far out of your reach the call If you are out there, come forward. If you're going to Children's Church, this is your time to head this direction. And you'll have to deal with me because Brother Danny's not here today. So come right up here. What's up, man? How are you? You know, there we go, right there. What's up? How are you? What's up? How are you? Y'all doing okay? All right. What's up? Hey, come on. You got it. Come on. All right. So today, y'all are going to go and hang out, but you're not just going to have fun. Who are you going to learn about? Jesus! There you go. I like that. Who are you going to worship? Jesus! And guess what? Whenever you leave, who are we supposed to talk about? Jesus! All right. Y'all got all the right answers. All right. Y'all head out just right there. Jesus. That's right. Just Jesus. I like that right there. All right. And we are so thankful uh, for all the things that happened. Miss Anita just sang a song for us. Just say Jesus. And I love that hymn that was brought up, or that, I don't even know if it's actually a hymn, it's a, a, probably more of a modern 1960s, 1970s song, Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. How many of you have ever found yourself in a place where you were just like, Jesus, I'm, that's all I can say. That's the only place I've ever been. I mean, we, we've all gotten there, we've all been there, you may be sitting here this morning saying I don't know what else to say well just as Miss Anita sang and just like we sang a while ago when I fight I fight on my knees what that shows is a pure dependence on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that he is your defender that he is your foundation that he is your he's even the offense that you don't have to be a part of, you just have to follow. 
That is who our Savior is. And that's what we're going to see this morning in Psalm chapter 7. And as we uh, said next week, hopefully Danny will be back and he will be filling the pulpit next Sunday. And we'll just keep putting it off until Danny is back and able to preach. And so uh, I, this week he had built, so just so y'all know, there's a prop that he had built and everything. And yesterday we, they had to come and tear it all down and all that kind of stuff because it's for his sermon. And so we're excited about that service. So come back next week and hear Danny preach. At the same time, as I was showing my girls, uh, I was like, this is what a normal sermon looks like in my Bible. And then when you have to do more of a Saturday special because you're like, oh, I wasn't supposed to preach this week, but thankfully we're walking through Psalms and I've done some of my background work. So I have most of it done. So I was very thankful for that, but we're going to be in chapter 7 and it's all about Jesus being the one who holds us, God being the one who defends us, even when all we can say is, is oh my god oh my god because that's where david is if you remember chapters one and two of psalms is really wisdom psalms they're teaching us how to live to honor the lord and how to live in the lord so that was follow his word and it was to honor the son to kiss the ring remember it says kiss the son basically give full surrender to jesus christ that's what psalms one and two talks about is that we're to follow his word and follow the lord and then as you got into, as we got into three four and five it was all about the stress in life and how you go to bed well and then it was about how you wake up well and then it was about being able to lay your worries at jesus's feet to be able to have restful nights and see the future see that the future is bright with jesus so now we get into chapter seven and we have this moment and this is a very pointed moment in david's life he is the writer of this psalm if you look at the title uh, it's not verse one it's just the title of the psalm in your bible if you have a title it says a shagion okay now you may be thinking what's a shagion of david well it's a mournful song is what it is it's a cry out to god it's almost like a sad country love song okay y'all remember all those just those sad love songs it's kind of like that it's kind of that plea for that person that's lost but this is a worshipful plea sad disjointed it's a time of stress but a cry out to god and david is the one writing it and just so to give you the history of it before we read it um it says as he was dealing with cush the benjaminite now there are three prevailing thoughts on this you say how can all three be prevailing well because all three of them are as good of, of a guesstimation an educated guesstimation as we can come up with okay so first is is that this is just an unknown guy cush the benjamite that's causing problems in david's life that's the first the second one is that it was a courier for or a courier for king saul and we'll get into that in just a second um, that's very plausible i tend to fall on the third one which is what david did is that he used a different name to describe king saul and we'll get into that in just a minute but so if you look back at first samuel and you see the story of saul becoming king the first time he introduces saul it says there is a man named saul from kish so cush and kish are very close and he's a benjaminite okay so that's what you have from the tribe of benjamin and so this whole psalm is about David having to deal with people talking behind his back, accusing him of something that he has not done, and that he knows that he stood in God's plan. He knows that I am righteous, that I'm innocent in this. It's one of those moments that if you watch Law and Order, it's the people who will not confess because they say, I'm not going to confess to something I didn't do. I'm not going to give any ground to something that I did not take part in. And that's what David is crying out to God about in this text. He is saying, I know I am okay. God, I stand before you completely innocent, and I don't know why this is happening. And we're going to see how we should handle, as David was handling, when somebody not just gossips, okay? Gossip is when they tell something that may be true, but it's none of their business. Gossip doesn't have to be untruth. It's just things that shouldn't probably be said besides the person who has actually experienced it. Um, one of the things that we always used to laugh about is that prayer request was actually just what we call the God-ordained gossip hour. Because people would say, oh, I got a prayer request. Have you heard what? And they would go into it. 
And that's where we got to be careful because that can become gossip. Slander is where gossip becomes a weapon. That's what slander is. Slander is whenever something, whether it's true or not, becomes a weapon to tear somebody down. Slander. And that's what David is facing from this individual. Now, David is going to lean on God, but what the background really was saw in David, it's very complicated and it's a long history, so I'm going to give you the spark note version. David was a young man when Saul, probably in his early years, probably two, three, four, when Saul becomes king of Israel. Saul's the very first king of Israel. The people of God wanted a king to be like the other nations. The prophet Samuel said, no, you don't. That's not God's way. You do not need a king. However, they kept arguing, and God said, because you are a stubborn people, I will give you a king. And so he identified through the prophet a man who the Bible describes as head and shoulders above the rest. So what is that saying? He was tall. He was identifiable. He was a man of stature. But his stature didn't match his character. That's the problem with Saul. He had a big stature, but his character was not there. And so now you have a king of Israel, and he begins to do things that he thinks he should be able to do because God isn't working on his time schedule. He, he began to offer sacrifices without the prophet. He began to say, I can speak to God instead of the prophet. And he started to take up a, an assumption of who he was. And so God punishes him by saying, your line will no longer be the line to control Israel, to be the king of Israel. Now that probably came as very harsh, and Samuel now has the task of finding God's anointed one, okay? So that's the actual wording, and he goes and he tries to find him, and God leads him to Jesse's house. Now, if you read through the Old Testament, it's a beautiful story how Ruth and Boaz get married. They have a child. His name is Obed. Obed has a son. His name is Jesse, and Jesse has multiple sons, but the youngest one is named Yavik which is David to us. And so David is the runt of the litter. So when Samuel comes to the house to find the next king of Israel, when he goes to Jesse's house, he shows up. They know who Samuel is. When he says, I am Samuel, the mouthpiece of God, Jesse knows something is going on. So he brings all his sons, the oldest first, and they go through it, and Samuel says, not him, not him, not him, not him. And he gets to the end of the line, and Samuel says, don't you have any other children? And he says, well, I do, but he's out in the, he's out in the field tending the sheep. Now, I don't know if you spent much time around 13-year-old, 12-year-old boys. I want to tell you something. If you're a 13, 12-year-old boy right now, sorry, I'm about to offend you. They're crazy. Ron and I used to ride in a van, and I would drive, I drive everywhere we go, it's just kind of what happens when I get in the car, I drive. And so I'm driving, and Rhonda would sit in the passenger seat of a 15-passenger van, and we had a youth group that we would take a junior high uh, camp and a high school camp. So we would fill vans with all high school boys, and then there would be vans just all uh, junior high girls. So junior high boys, junior high girls. And Rhonda would ride with me. And Rhonda used to say, if we just started taking notes of the conversations that junior high boys have, we could make millions writing a book about what they talk about. And you would listen, and you were like, because there's no rhyme or reason. They're just nuts. We learned that Superman and Batman could take over Spider-Man and Iron Man, and we learned all these things about Marvel and DC. Then they started talking about Star Wars and Star Trek. They started doing all this stuff. Then they started talking about things that we're like, we have no clue what they're talking about. And, and David was just like them in the sense of he was a 13-year-old boy. I imagine his brother is like, we're going to walk out there, and Samuel is going to be standing there, and he's going to be like, hey, have you ever seen a frog up close? That's who David was. He was just a boy. And that's why Jesse was like, yeah, but he's just out, in the, he's just out there. He's not a warrior. He's not ready to lead. But I want to tell you this, even if you feel like that God's not able to use you, he can use you. And Samuel said, bring me the boy. And the Bible tells us that whenever he saw David, he knew that that was God's chosen, and he anointed him as the next king. Now, if you just think about how the world was at that point, I mean, if you remember, like, 
Caesar and the Roman Empire, which would be about a thousand years later from David, you know that the throne is a very important place, not just important, they would kill over it. They wouldn't just kill over it, they would kill their own family over it. They, they, would, they would murder their own family to take the throne. Well, the same thing happened with Saul. He knew what Samuel had done. He knew what God had told him. He knew what the price was for his rebellion and his sinfulness. And David was just this young boy. But as David would gain popularity because Samuel had not only anointed him, David showed up at the Philistine battle lines. And we all know the story that he was just a young man with a sling and he picked up five smooth stones from a brook. I always wonder why he picked up five. Either he wasn't a good shot or he was like, God, I may need five for this guy. I don't know. But he picked up five smooth stones, but it only says he threw one. And he killed the warrior of the Philistines, Goliath. And so he gains popularity because now he's not just the anointed to be king, he is also the reigning champion of warriors. They would haul him into Jerusalem and they would say, Saul's killed his thousands, but David's killed his ten thousands. And that, that selfishness and that jealousy rose in Saul's life. But not only that, Saul had some type of we don't know it, the Bible doesn't tell us that he had a problem uh, Like some type of disorder, but he could be happy and mad within seconds And we're not talking about like just the normal sway like something bad happens like oh man like total Different people and so he would call David in knowing that he was God's anointed and he would say listen I'm being troubled by the evil spirits play your heart for me and David would sit and play his heart so this is one of those kids that if you are a dad of a girl and maybe this just speaks to me because I have three girls this is that kid in the youth group that's good looking he's a smooth talker and he can sing don't come near my daughter okay that's just not how this works but that's who David was he was he was kind of the Bible says he was ruddy in appearance he was handsome very handsome and he could sing and play and he was a warrior, so he was like, he was that guy. But he would come in, and he would play his harp, and it would soothe Saul. But Saul also would hate him almost automatically and try to take his life over and over. Even invite him to his dinner table one time to have a spear and throw it across the table at David to try to kill him. And so for, for a certain amount of time before Saul passed away in battle, was killed in battle, actually took his own life, David was in hiding. And what David experiences is sometimes how we feel in our life. I don't know what you're going through right now, but you may have made a stand for the Lord, or you may be walking in righteousness, and there's people at your office saying, have you, have you dealt with them? They're not even a real person. This is what they do. They're just doing that so they can get a promotion. They're just, doing, they're just saying that they're ethical. They're just saying that they have character. They're just going the way that they say is right because they just want to do that. Maybe they've made up a complete lie about you. Well, this is their real motive. This is what they really want. You and your spouse may be in that. You may be having discussions with your spouse, and when the argument happens, when you say, this is what I think, your spouse looks at you and says, only because this is what you want. David is feeling the slander of Cush the Benjaminite, which I think David, throughout the entire time he was being pursued by Saul, never killed Saul, even though he had multiple opportunities to do it. And I think when he wrote this psalm, he still wanted to give honor to God's chosen and didn't want to bear bad, a bad image of Saul. That's why I think it was Saul Cush the Benjaminite. But David shows us very sweetly, and actually very shortly, even though it's 17 verses, of what he truly rests in when he has no ability to stop what people say. One thing that we have to understand in our life is that people can say whatever they want, and we have no ability to deal with it. And how we handle those lies or accusations actually speaks a whole lot about who we believe we truly trust in. 
So if you'll stand with me as we read from God's word, we're going to read chapter 7 now that you know the historical context of where we're at. David is most likely hiding in a cave, and he's crying out to his God. And we're going to start and read the entire chapter, so bear with me, beginning in verse 1. And if you will say this with me, as we always do, we stand in honor of God's word because it is his holy, infallible, inerrant word. It is completely true and trustworthy. It is necessary for the unbeliever to find forgiveness, salvation through Jesus Christ and for the believer to live a life of godliness. The Bible is the word of God. Church, do you believe that? This is what the word of the Lord says. Psalm chapter 7, verse 1. O Lord my God, in you I do take refuge Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it to pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger, lift, up, uh, lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, for you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to your righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart, and God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation or anger every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made, and his mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness and i will sing praise to the name of the lord the most high god dear heavenly father we pray this morning that you would use your word to bend and break us as you mold mend and make us more like your son father we try to control every situation in our life even when it's about other people who are part of our life whether they're friend or foe Lord, I ask that we would learn from David today that you are the righteous judge. You are the one who reveals. You are the shield. And you are the only refuge. We pray these things in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So you have David who is dealing with slander. You say, how do we know this is slander? So there's a couple of things I want to point out to you that leads to why this is him dealing with people talking in a way that's bringing him down. First, if you go to verse 14, it says, Behold, the wicked man conceives evil. So it's somebody who's come up with a plan, who's pregnant with mischief, has devised how he's going to lay out that plan and actually achieve it. And then he says, and gives birth to lies. So this is specifically, he is focusing in on someone who has decided, I'm going to tear David down. I'm going to make people think wrong about David. I'm going to make sure no one thinks well of him. That's what we see in verse 14. But I also want you to know there is this moment uh, that he, when he is talking, he says, listen, God, I need you in verse 2. He says, I need you because they're going to tear my soul apart. Notice he doesn't say body. He's not worried about physical violence at this moment. He's worried about what it's doing to him spiritually. He's saying, this is going to tear my soul apart. So whenever you hear 
Someone has said, and, and we've all been there, I'm a pastor, people say stuff about pastors all the time. They say, well, they don't like us or whatever. It, you may have been in an office relationship of some sort where somebody just, every time you seem to like, okay, here's what we're going to do, they're like, well, why do you want to do that? You just want that next step, don't you? And they just build that way. Maybe you never hear them say it, they're just saying it behind your back, whatever the case may be. He's worried about, he's concentrating on this thought process all the time of, man, this is tearing me apart. What they're saying is tearing me apart. I am focused on this, these lies, this deception, all the things that they're saying, this slander that's coming against me, I need to deal with it. So the first thing I want to point out to you is, uh, we've said it every week, and I'm going to say it again. If you want to find real peace in your life, you have to really pray to the real Prince of Peace. You will not find peace unless you pray to the Prince of Peace. You will not find peace until Jesus is the Lord of your life, who will answer prayers, as Philippians chapter 4 tells us, that when we make our requests and supplications known to God, that he will answer them, and he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Now listen, which is yours, but you got to hear why it's yours. In Christ Jesus. Check me on it, Philippians chapter 4, 6, and 7. My favorite text. You can't have peace unless you pray. You say, I will not have peace until I pray. No, you won't. That's how it's always been. That's how it always will be. Why? Peace does not reign in your heart. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and his reign brings peace. So if you're not willing to bow to Jesus, there's no peace. And so what does David demonstrate for us again? Now I'm going to go back for just a second. If you look at, ver at chapter 3, uh, yeah, at chapter 3, he's saying, save me, O God. This is where he's admitting the things that he needs. He says, O Lord, what is that? He's praying. You go to chapter 4, answer me when I call, O Lord. What's he doing? Praying. Chapter 5, give ear to my words, O Lord. He's praying. Chapter 6, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger. What's he doing? Praying. And we fight prayer. We fight prayer. Why? It's unnatural to us. It's, it's sitting still with God. And right now, we can't be in a room without noise because we just have to have something in the background. We, we have so distanced ourselves from being in isolation and meditation that we, we can't handle it. And prayer is what David has constantly thrown out. And if you look at chapter 8, Oh, Lord. You get to chapter 10, well, 9, it says, Oh, Lord. It's a couple, of, it's just right down. It's a praise offering. Chapter 10, Oh, Lord. You're going to see that prayer, David's root of his peace is that he prays. I can't, I can't, I mean, that's not an exaggeration. I just can't emphasize it enough. If you do not have peace in your life, I can promise you this. You may be praying but you're not praying to God, you're praying from your God to somebody who you think can just fix something. But when you pray to God, realizing that you're not, he brings peace. So David is in the midst of this, and he says, oh Lord my God. Now remember, last week I pointed out to you, if the Bible has all caps where it says Lord in an English translation, that means it's Jehovah or Yahweh, which is the same word, just two different languages and how they put them together. That's the relationship, I love you God. It's the covenant God. It's the one that says, I want to be with you. But notice, he says, not only relationship God, he follows, follows it up with Elohim, which is creator, all-powerful God. So he's saying, in this prayer, he starts off with, you are a God who created everything that you desire to hear me and you desire to have a relationship. That's where he starts off. And he says, you are my righteous refuge. That's what you see in verse one. He says, listen, whenever I can't control it, I have to run to you. And why can I run to you? That's what we see in verses three through nine. You see, we can trust in him because he's the righteous judge. Now with this, it's not just the righteous judge of those doing wrong. Notice that David doesn't start with judge them. David says, I am a man, I am fallible, I have issues, I may have worked for my own good, 
I have thought processes that, God, if I didn't follow your commands and your will, let me know. That's what we see, verse 3, oh, Lord, if I have done this. So he's hearing the accusations coming probably from the throne room of Israel, the highest regarded place. And it's from the king. And he says, if I have done these, if I have repaid. And he says a word right here that's very interesting. He says, my friend. If he's actually talking about the guy who's tried to kill him, and we don't know what the accusation was, but you notice how his heart is not bent against the slanderer. His heart is, God, I need you to show me if I failed. And the righteous judge just doesn't judge those who we feel have done wrong. The righteous judge judges all. And David sees that as an important part to put in. If I have done something wrong, let me, and, and this is a dangerous prayer. He said, if I've done something wrong, let them trample my, let them overtake me, let it be so, and let me be proven that I was wrong. Man, that is a tough prayer. But then he says, Arise, O Lord, and lift up yourself against the fear of my enemies. And he says something that I think we often deal with. God, where are you? He says, Awake for me. I can't control what they're saying. I just have to rest in you, that you are righteous, that you are going to do what you've always done, that you are not going to let the wicked prevail over the righteous. And so you read through verse 9. And that's what the whole call to God is. That God judges everyone. And that there's this, there's this righteousness in God that requires him, requires him to rule justly. So at the end of verse 11, there's an interesting statement because it talks about God being the righteous judge in verse 11. But it says, And a God who feels indignation, a hateful Anger. That's what indignation is. It's hateful anger. You say, well, God can't hate. Oh, yes, he hates one thing. Sin. He hates it. it it's because it separates everything from him. He can't be around sinfulness. He doesn't like, why? Because he is disgusted in such a way by sin that it is repulsive to him. Yet because he's a righteous judge, he has to deal with it. And so what we see in this picture, and I think it's very important that we grasp this concept, is that David understands that the righteous and the unrighteous will be judged by God. I think that's what we often forget. Well, I've been saved. I don't stand before God. David is saying exactly the opposite. He's saying, judge me right now. Point it out to me so it can be dealt with. Let me know where I failed. What is that? That's a, a humility. It's a humble response to, I know who you are and I know who I am. That I have the character to fail. So Rhonda and I, um, we just started listening to, I asked her, I said, would you listen to me? It's a podcast about this large church in the Northwest who was built over 14 years and some accusations of pride and arrogance and really bullying was made against the pastor. And in two weeks, the accusations were made. They started to study about, well, the accusations were made, but they started to study. And as they began the process of telling, hey, this is what we need to do, the pastor stepped down in a church that had 15 locations and over 15,000 people attending every Sunday in less than six weeks went to zero. Fifteen thousand people who had a church home went to zero now i can tell you this there is not an individual in this room who if their fame or their notoriety outgrows their character will stand because your character is what keeps you at a place of consciousness of your own sin but what is happening to David is he's understanding, I'm fallible, I can fall, every one of us can. And he's saying, listen, you're the righteous judge, you do judge. But what does it mean by this indignation? Is that we've built God to be this God-loving 
fatherly figure that we can just run to, and he is Yahweh. But the Bible also tells us that he's completely holy and he is the righteous judge. And friend, if you're sitting in this room and you've never trusted Jesus as the Lord of your life, you say, well, God is okay with me. No, he's not. We can beat around the bush and say, you know what, God loves you, he does. But until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, understanding that you are separated from God by your unholiness and because he is holy, there is a hateful wrath against your sinfulness that you still walk underneath until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And there's no simple way around it. But there is an answer. And his name is Jesus Christ. You, you want to hear what's so crazy about this? Is that while we didn't deserve it, while we were yet sinners, that God loved us in this way that he sent Christ to die for us, Romans? Is that God loved his creation, you so much, knowing that you had no chance, but his anger burned against us so much that when Jesus came, lived a life that we couldn't, and he said, I will take their place. I will be in their place in death. I will take the wrath of God for them, be their substitute, so you can ha they can take my righteousness and you can see me on them. That's what Jesus did. The Bible says that the anger was so heavy in God toward the sinfulness of man that when he finally got to pour it out, and you say pour out his anger, yes. When Jesus hung on the cross, the sky went black, the earth shook. Things happened that had never happened before on the planet. People didn't know what was going on. It was a bursting emotion from God, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just I'm done, I get to just do this. It was relief for God. How do we know that? Isaiah says, that we are healed by his stripes. And he was bruised for our transgressions, but it says that it pleased God to crush him to save us. What David understands is that God is going to judge everyone. And if you are separated from God by your sin, you've never trusted him his anger is still there, and you say, well, when am I going to face that judgment? Well, one, you're walking in judgment right now. But the Bible tells us that every, day's, every man's days are appointed, and on the day of that appointment, the man shall die, and on that day, judgment. And you're going to stand before the throne, and you will be judged. The question is, is this Jesus your substitute, or was he just somebody that you talked about? This morning, I hope you don't leave this place knowing that not only is God a righteous judge, but Jesus is a righteous shield and that he took your place so that you could have a relationship with God. That's what David knows. Now, we have the righteous refuge in verses 1 and 2 and understanding that this is tearing my soul out and so I take refuge in you. I can't control people. We have the righteous judge. We have the righteous shield who we can't stop at all, but he's going to stop what's coming at us, and he can protect you. You see, our first goal is, is to go on the offense. As soon as somebody makes an accusation, what do we do? We go, well, that's not true. Let me tell you why. I can get, they know. And what do we do? We start doing what tears families apart, what tears churches apart, what tears businesses apart, what tears countries apart. It tears everything apart. What it is, it's politics. That's all it is. Whose side are you on? And in a church or in a family, it's, well, this is what they did. Well, how do you know? Well, I've got my little group over here that we all know this is what happened. And then the other person saying, well, that's not what happened. They all know what really happened. We form enemies within our own context, and that's what's happened in David's life. Those who are all supposed to be together as the people of God of Israel, they're on different sides now. And so God shields from what is happening but here's what we know about God, is that he always reveals unrighteousness. See, the Bible always points out unrighteousness in our life. And that's what we see in verses 12 through 16. It's talking about this person. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword, and he is uh, bent and readied his bow, and he's prepared. And then it talks about the person and their actual thing, and we talked about that. How do we know it was slander? It's a person who devised the plan, is implementing a plan, and it's lies. That's what David's dealing with. 
but it says this he makes a pit digging it out the bible tells us in proverbs that where there are many words sin abounds and it says it that that's one particular verse that's the actual verse but it says that same thing over and over and over again and we often think well that's just talking to somebody that talks a lot you know i don't think that you can just brace that one verse in that way it's kind of like unequally yoked it's talking about marriage but when you make a covenant with anybody you are yoking yourself to them whether it's in business whether it's in marriage whether it's in a church and if you're unequally yoked there's a problem there that's why we take new membership very seriously and if you're going to become a member of our church you're going to share your testimony with us and we need to know what you've been where you've been and what you believe because the message of the gospel is way too important but in this context of where words are plenty sins abounds when our first defense against someone who is attacking us is to begin to talk oftentimes we dig our own hole as well we start creating a side we start saying well this is what they said so it's my right to be able to say something and what david demonstrates is it's not about what his right is it's about who he wants to be right with it's not his right it's who he wants to be right with he would rather be right with god and let god handle it than him be right does that make sense and that's why he says this is my refuge this is my shield and they're going to fall into the pit they're the ones that's going to be shown to be immoral and god is faithful to judge righteously in the very first book of the bible in genesis around chapter four cain and abel is the story and cain has a visit from god because god is not happy with him and god says this very specific statement he says be careful because sin is crouching at your door what it's saying is is that sin can overtake you at any moment and you will be found out the people of israel when they were conquering the territory in numbers the bible says your sin shall surely find you out what moses said in context it was that a group of men said this is what we're going to do so we allow us to do it moses said sure if you do this and you do what we say you can do it but if you don't complete it your sin shall surely find you out so what that is when you know what is right and you don't do it that's what this scripture is about the new testament would tell us that when somebody comes up against you to turn the other cheek to continue to love them to continue to do things that's why i think it's so interesting that david says when he's a, making the accusation he says if i have hurt my friend even the person that wants to kill him he's like they're your chosen they're your person my friend and he's staying on top he's rising above because he knows who really is going to judge now this always brings the question up why does god allow us to walk through some really bad things even whenever we're innocent well i want you to know that we have built an american christian culture we've said this a couple of times in this series already that if god's good with you your life will be good which is completely contradictory to what this says in fact the bible says that in this world you will have trouble jesus said if they hate you remember they hated me first and when he says hate he means hate they tried to tear him down they slandered him they lied about him jesus was executed on lies and on um on fabricated charges unverified crimes but we have this tendency to think when they're talking bad about god we're innocent why is this happening and here's what i want to tell you when you walk righteously and the enemy pushes back the enemy hates when a dad leads his family the enemy hates when a marriage is saved the enemy hates whenever a business leader says i won't walk that type of road the enemy hates whenever a couple decides that commitment is more than compassion at the moment because they can't get along for a moment the enemy hates whenever children are raised in the word of god the enemy hates all those things if you think that you're going to walk with god and the enemy is not going to use ungodly people to hurt hurt you you are sorely mistaken 
I often ask people when they say, I just don't understand why they're doing this. I say, are they saved or not? And they go, what's that matter? And I said, because lost people act like lost people. And the truth is not in them. That doesn't mean we ridicule. In fact, David would show us otherwise. I prayed for him. He's my friend. I'm trying to see what you're going to do, God. And then they say, well, I believe they're a believer. That's where character has to take. Is the Holy Spirit in charge of a person's character more than they are? But why, does he, why do these bad things happen? Well, when I was in third grade, I know it's hard to think that I can remember that long ago, but when I was in third grade, I had to memorize Hebrews 11, the whole thing, okay? And that's not really that much. I have a friend named Tim. Tim went to Bible drill, and I'm not talking about Baptist Bible drill. You want to know who memorized Scripture? Talk to the Pentecostals. They memorize Scripture. I mean, they memorize it. Now, there's things we don't agree with, but I will tell you this. When it says, hide your word in my heart, the Pentecostals take that, like, literally. He could quote, and I'm not exaggerating, almost the entire New Testament after Acts, like from Romans through Jude. And you would say, hey, what's Jude 12? And he would go, okay, hang on for a second. And he would quote that scripture. What's Ephesians 4, 6? And he would quote that scripture. We had to memorize Hebrews 11. We thought we were doing well. But Hebrews 11 is a famous text. It's the hall of faith. And I brought it up before. But it talks about all the things that people had to do just based on God telling them and then believing it. But there's this point in, chat, in verse 37, I believe. Let me make sure. Yes, in verse 37, it talks about the life of people who followed God. Hebrews 11, 37 says this. So here's what you need to know. When life throws things at you and this world is up against you, you're not in the wrong company. You're in the best company. So here's what it says in Hebrews 11, chapter 30, verse 37. It says, other, well, it's 36 is where it starts. Well, let's go back even further than that. Let's go to 35. It says, Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, that they may rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sewn in two, literally sawn in half. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats. Basically, they couldn't go by because they were, basically, they had a mark put on them that they couldn't trade with the normal people. So they couldn't buy woven. They had to just deal with whatever for clothes. They were destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. But of them, the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith. You see, church, whenever the enemy sees you in integrity we're not talking about hey i walked off in something that i shouldn't have and people are talking about it that's not the situation when you sin your sin shall surely find you out don't try to claim that but when you're walking in integrity you're like god you know my heart you know what i was doing you know where it is david says he is your refuge he is the righteous judge that will handle it so rest in him let him handle the process and you're in good company and it's not just because of the people that are listed in Hebrews 11. It's because you're in the best company. It means that you're in the company of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The one who said, in this world you will have trouble. The one who said, if this world hates you, remember they hated me first. So the question is this morning, are you in his company? If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, friend, this morning... You will not have peace until you know the Prince of Peace. You will not understand what he can do for you until you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. You do not and will not understand until you surrender your life to him. And what does that mean? It means there's a holy God that we talked about. He's completely holy, and he cannot be around anyone or anything that is separated from him by sinfulness. Because of that, even though you were separate, he desires a relationship with you. He's Jehovah, the covenanting God, the one that says, I want to know you, and I want you to know me. He sent Jesus to live a life that you couldn't, and Jesus lived that life, and when it was the right time, 
he gave his life completely holy and honest and righteous. And he died a death that we all deserve. And he took your place. He took my place. And the Bible tells us that God poured all his wrath. You see, accepting Jesus is not about being saved from hell. It's about being saved back to God, redeemed back to God. The Bible tells that God poured all that wrath out so you could have a relationship with Jesus through Jesus Christ with God. And if you surrender your life, Lord, every bit of your life to him, the Bible tells us that he sends the Holy Spirit to seal you unto salvation and that we are to constantly walk with God and work to be filled by the Spirit. And friend, if you've never surrendered to Jesus Christ, I hope today that you would. If you want peace, you've got to know who brings peace. but it comes at a huge cost, your life. Maybe you are dealing with something in the background like David was, and Cliff's going to come out and lead us in a time of invitation, and maybe you can't control what somebody's saying about you. You may be sitting in this room and you're separated. You may be sitting in this room and your uh, business partner is against you now. You may be sitting in this room and... You're a part of a teaching group at the schools, and some of those teachers just are not nice. Maybe that circle of friends that you thought were really good friends, you find out that there's another text stream. You say, really, you're going to go that? Yeah, because it happens. It's real life. There's another text stream that they're talking about you behind your back. God says, take refuge in me, or it's going to tear you apart. David would say, I want to run to you because I know it's going to tear me apart. And I know you're going to bring it to light. You're going to do what you're supposed to do. But God, shield me. If you want to know something about a shield, which I think is so cool, is it doesn't only stop the attacks, it's the thing you put behind, but you can't move forward and you can't do anything on the offense when you're hiding behind a shield. So what does it mean? God is shielding you from the offense, but you bearing him and him being your shield keeps you from moving forward in an incorrect way as well. And this morning, you may just need to give that to God and say, God, you know my heart. You know what I was doing. But I need you. And I will give you praise. And remember what David says at the very end. I give thanks, not because you're a good God, not because you're going to do what I ask. What does he say? Because of your righteousness, that you will always do what is right and completely right. And I give you praise for that. This morning, do you trust in that? If you need to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you need to find a church home. Maybe you just need to lay down your thoughts about somebody who's been speaking about you behind your back. Or maybe, just maybe, you need to say, I've been the one that's speaking behind somebody's back. Whatever the case may be, this time's for you. As Cliff leads us, would you stand and let's sing together. But this time's for you.